Okay, here we go. Chapter 9, China in the World, East Asian Connections 500 to 1300. And we are going to go ahead and start with the reemergence of a united China. So the Han Dynasty had collapsed around 220 CE, and that led to about a 300 year of uh, kind of chaos, another similar aspect to your warring states, is political fragmentation. You had your lords and kings uh, fighting over land and uh, trade routes. Uh, Confucianism is going to be discredited during this time because obviously the uh, such a collapse and failure of the Han Dynasty and things weren't working out. And you're also at this time going to see a huge migration southward uh, where you'll also see a lot more uh, land that you're able to farm in this area. And what's going to end up happening because of this is we're going to see the north become more industrialized and commercialized and we'll see the south become more agricultural. Uh, now, a golden age of Chinese achievement is going to occur between the Sui, the Tang, and the Song, especially the Southern Song, and I'll be explaining more when I get to them. So your Sui dynasty is 589 to 618, and it uh, reunified China. And so the Sui rulers are vastly extended the canal system, which is going to help for transportation from the north and south and south to north. Uh, but their ruthlessness and failure to conquer Korea alienated the people and exhausted state resources. We're also going to see a similar mistake down the road when we look at the Mongols and they try to uh, conquer Japan. We'll see the same uh, mistake that happens. Or if they just would have stayed more in a, the area of China, things might have lasted longer. Dynasty was overthrown, but <clears throat> it was quickly overthrown. And so you're not, you're not having another problem like you did with the collapse of the Han Dynasty. And so here's our extent of the Sui Dynasty. And so you can see starting to move down into that southern part near Vietnam, uh, getting up to the northern part uh, up near the Yellow Sea, getting into uh, close to Korea. All right, the Tang Dynasty, 618. So you can see the immediate, the, the immediate uh, transition from the Sui ending in 618, Tang beginning in 618. And then the Song 960, uh, to 1279 and so these will be your two major uh, dynasties that the Sui kind of laid a foundation for and so they're going to establish patterns of Chinese life that are going to last until the 20th century all the way up until uh, communism is going to arise in the contemporary era that we'll be studying about second semester it's regarded as the golden age of arts and literature and uh, we'll also see a uh, uh, commerce as well because they are going to become extremely wealthy under these two especially under the tang for a period and then really the southern song is going to have a uh, even have a, a nightlife with restaurants and um, streets um, that are going to be uh, have businesses and uh, kind of like downtown areas it's it's kind of uh, sophisticated for that time. Six major ministries were created along with the censorate for um, civilians, uh, surveillance, and uh, basically spies, uh, making sure everything's working correctly. The examination system will be uh, revived to uh, staff the bureaucracy and a proliferation of schools and colleges. So they're going to have a, a heavy focus on your literature, your arts, your uh, bureaucracy, your trainings, your education. A large share of official positions went to sons of the elite. So even though they're going to still have a merit system, there's obviously still the elite system that's going to come into play. And even with some of the strict rules that are going to come into play uh, <clears throat> to help uh, curtail cheating, there's still the elites that are going to get their children their jobs. Uh, large landowners continue to be powerful despite state efforts to redistribute land to the peasants. And that's going to be a continuity throughout this whole time period. All right, here's the extent of the Tang Dynasty, so you can see how large it is. Um, pretty huge compared to your modern-day state, uh, which you can see that outline of modern-day China. And uh, here's another uh, version of that, again, seeing that modern-day uh, extent in the white. A little bit harder on this map, but you can see the extent of the Sui and the Tang. And here's another comparison map for you as well, especially that southern song where they're going to be fleeing southward. All right, economic revolution under the song uh, had great prosperity. 
And so rapid population growth is going to occur under this time period uh, from 5 million to 60 million from 100 and uh, all the way up to 120 million by 1200. And you're going to see great improvement in agricultural production. There's going to be some contact with your Southeast Asian areas. Uh, Vietnam, they're going to get better rice from that area and uh, be able to have it grow in uh, harsher climates uh, and also be able to sustain uh, different seasons. China was the most urbanized region in the world. They're going to have multiple cities, um, well over a million people, which uh, the next... Um, biggest cities are pretty much going to be uh, in India and you'll have Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire that is going to reach a pretty high number before their decline. But again, the majority are going to be in China. A great network of internal waterways, canals, rivers, and lakes with their irrigation systems, their damming systems. A great improvements in industrial production, uh, your uh, textiles, that they're going to be dealing with. You're also going to have the invention of the uh, print, so both woodblock and movable type. You're going to see a slide towards the end of this that's going to have some achievements, and that might be something you want to pause on and look at because there's been some questions previously on the AP exam, or of course, it obviously can always help with evidence in an essay. Best navigational and shipping technology in the world uh, at this time. Uh, their uh, seafaring ability, they are going to have some amazing ships. I wish, if you ever get the time to watch this on the History Channel, they have a thing on the Chinese ships during this time period. They had ships that would hold thousands and thousands of people, like massive ships. Uh, and they could go up and down the rivers. So this just wasn't ocean-going ships. These were ships that went up and down the rivers. And they could land, and uh, the sides of the ships would fall apart, and people could just come out of them. Uh, with the military and catapults and archers and uh, they were just warships that were amazing and so um, anyway it's a really cool episode on the History Channel worth watching I wish we had the time to watch it or we would uh, the invention of gunpowder um, now obviously Europeans are going to take that to the next level uh, later in uh, towards the end of this unit that we'll discuss all right, production for the market rather than for local consumption was widespread. So even though China had been kind of isolated, which we will see the Zheng He expeditions later down the road, but um, even though they um, even though they had been more uh, isolated, uh, there's going to be a lot of merchants that come to them, and they are going to have a lot of um, seafaring aspects in Southeast Asia. You just don't see long expeditions uh, until Zheng He, and so. Um, we kind of think of them as being like sheltered almost, but they really weren't. They just wanted to control their own environment the way that they wanted to. Uh, cheap transportation allowed peasants to grow specialized crops. Uh, government demand uh, demanded payment of taxes in cash, not in kind. And so um, that is going to help uh, establish a banking system. And you're going to have the growth of paper money and finances and loans and um, you're going to end up uh, being able to fund some of this trade. And so that's going to help some of the uh, um, wider spread market that they're going to have. All right, um, looking at women in the Song Dynasty, the era wasn't very golden for women, though. This will be the age of Neo-Confucianism. And so during the Tang Dynasty, elite women in the north had greater freedom because of the nomads. But then under the song, you're going to see that patriarchal restriction start to emerge. Um, literature highlighted the um, subjection of women as well during this time period. Uh, one of those aspects of women and their um, subjection, um, submission uh, to men is going to be foot binding, which started in the 10th or 11th century. Uh, and this is the whole idea of the, uh, the lotus flower. Uh, you're having a... Um, wasn't a mistress. It was kind of this concubine that, that were dancing and she had really tiny feet and there was all these lotus flowers uh, around the stage and her, her foot had been wrapped in it and uh, the emperor at the time thought it was absolutely beautiful and uh, that uh, women with small feet uh, were beautiful and uh, kind of um, it was kind of this erotic, erotic aspect of uh, feet and look. And so that's going to slowly start to spread throughout society. And, um, well, if you've ever seen any of the image, they're not pretty of 
what women go through and uh, basically what it causes is women are going to be stuck in the home now uh, because really it's an extremely painful process to go through that the children are. They start at an early age. Um, as they get older, it's kind of crippling. And so in a way, this is forcing women to stay in the home. Men will be taking a lot more of their jobs. And so uh, it was a big struggle for them. Uh, textile production became on a larger scale, displacing women from their traditional role in the industry. Women found other roles in cities. Uh, prosperity of the elites created demand for concubines, entertainers, uh, courtesans, prostitutes. Uh, in some ways, the uh, position of women improved, though, because uh, property rights did expand and more, men, more women were able to get educated uh, in order to raise their sons better. So um, there were some freedoms. It wasn't totally restrictive, but compared to other times as well, women, it was pretty tough on them. All right, and here's a, an image. You can see the small feet, and you can even see the, uh, the little girl in the middle and how her feet are wrapped. And so already starting to have that process of foot binding already occurring. All right, there have been two enduring misconceptions of Chinese history. And so the idea that Chinese civilization was uh, impressive but largely static, the idea that China was a self-contained civilization. And so both of those are kind of your major misconceptions here. For most of its history, China's most enduring interaction with foreigners was in the north with the people of the steppes, your nomads. Um, and occasionally a creation of a powerful state or confederation emerged that might rival with China. Uh, but you a lot of times had a tribute system that they were able to take care of, which will be one of the problems for the Song Dynasty is that tribute system starts to not work out so well. All right, uh, pastoral societies needed grain and other farm products from China. Uh, leaders wanted Chinese manufactured and luxury goods. And so the pressure from uh, the north was um, consistent. So uh, the payments were difficult. Now, China liked to say they came up with this tribute system. Uh, but So that way there felt to be some superiority. But really what ended up happening is these outside areas really ended up controlling the tribute system uh, because in return for payment they were getting a lot of goods sometimes there were some marriages involved with uh, daughters of the uh, emperor or other royalty members and so uh, really the nomads are the ones who ended up controlling it and especially some of those larger, larger federations that end up emerging are going to be some of the bigger areas that control that aspects Another problem that China was facing is the nomads controlled a lot of the Silk Road routes where silk was traded. And so that's going to become something difficult that they're going to have to deal with. Uh, the tribute system in theory, uh, this is kind of what I was just talking about that they were having to deal with. Uh, and so uh, the, the system apparently worked for centuries, uh, but eventually we're going to see uh, the Song Dynasty really struggle when they take military power away from their military and put it in the hands of the bureaucrats and that's going to kind of be one of the last straws that hurts them. All right, the tribute system in practice, um, again, disguised um, and contradicted the realities of what was really going on. Um, your, I can't pronounce it, but your X-I-O-N-G-N-U uh, confederacy uh, was established around 200 BCE. Uh, and you're going to have some uh, Turkish empires in Mongolia where some of your uh, Turkish areas are going to come over that north area and uh, have a strong influence. Plus, some of them are going to be uh, educated. And so you're going to be dealing with some people that have an Islamic education down the road. Uh, but also, uh, early on, you'll have that Persian education influence as well. So there's going to be some sophistication uh, to these areas uh, to the north of China. So it's not just chaotic barbarians running around loose. All right, cultural influence across an ecological frontier. Uh, nomads who ruled parts of China often adopted Chinese ways, but Chinese culture did not have a great impact on the steppe nomads. Pastoral societies retained their own cultural patterns, but uh, most lived where Chinese-style agriculture was impossible. Interaction took the form of trade, military conflict, negotiations, uh, extortion, and some cultural influence. Uh, your steppe culture influenced part of the north, um, which were frequently ruled by nomads, and we're going to see this within the Song Dynasty, 
as well. The uh, Tang Dynasty, a fad among northern Chinese elites for anything connected to western barbarians. And so that's where you'll get some uh, aspects from the west coming over. All right, here's an area, that, a map that's showing these invasions. Uh, the Churgens are a, a large group that we'll learn about later down the road. All right, and so now we're going to be looking at sinification, which is a term that you need to make sure you understand. This is where you're kind of having the Chinese influence upon, upon its uh, surrounding neighbors of Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. And so there's going to be some agricultural and sedentary societies. Uh, their civilizations were shaped uh, by proximity to China but did not become Chinese. So that is important. Even with some of them that are going to have a lot of blending with China, they still have their own distinct culture and nature to their society. Similar to 20th century Afro-Asian societies that accepted elements of Western culture while maintaining their political and cultural independence. And so it's a, a good uh, comparison between time periods. Korea and China, uh, we'll look at them first. Uh, the interaction with China started with a temporary Chinese conquest of northern Korea during the Han Dynasty. Uh, and of course, uh, you'll see some problems with the uh, sway uh, not being able to really control it as well. But here's your Chinese influence and items of uh, spread. Uh, here's your uh, three major kingdoms. Uh, the Silla is a uh, very strong kingdom, even though it's not the largest, it was pretty strong. All right, Korean states emerged in 4th and 7th centuries. Uh, the states were rivals, also resisted Chinese political control. And the 7th century, the Silla Kingdom uh, allied with the Tang Dynasty and, um, <clears throat> and China to bring some political unity uh, to Korea. And so that's where you're going to see a little bit of um, a political influence in that area. Korea generally maintained political independence under the Silla. Um, and the uh, Koryo and the Yi dynasties. Uh, but China did provide uh, a legitimacy for Korean rulers, which helped uh, with their unity and backing them. Efforts to replicate the Chinese court life and administration uh, were still a struggle because the upper elites and the royalty were still going to hold those positions. So even though they tried with the Confucian uh, examination system, it still turned out that really... The people in charge were your royalty and family members. Uh, the capital city of uh, Kumsong uh, modeled on the Chinese capital of Chang'an, which literally block by block, they were copying the way that this, uh, s these capitals were. And so the Koreans were laying everything out because they thought it was well organized and sophisticated and flowed very well. All right, the acceptance of much Chinese culture, uh, Chinese luxury goods, scholarships, and religious influence. Uh, Confucianism had a negative impact on Korean women, especially after 1300. Uh, so you'll kind of get the uh, more of that Neo-Confucian strictness involved. Korea maintained its Korean culture, which is important, and we'll see that identity in all three of these satellite regions. Uh, Chinese cultural influence had little effect on Korea's surf-like peasants or large slave population that they're going to have. Only Buddhism moved beyond the Korean elite. Uh, obviously because of the acceptance within a not really having a social order within Buddhism. The examination system for bureaucrats never won prominence, which I had just mentioned, and that was because of the royalty that still existed within Korea. In the 1400s, Korea developed a uh, phonetic alphabet, which was important because that helped distinguish them uh, apart from the Chinese. Vietnam and China... All right, so we're going to shift uh, going down to the south now, Korea up in the north, Vietnam now in the south. And so the experience of Vietnam was broadly similar to that of Korea. Now, looking at the broad, there are going to be some minor differences here. But Vietnam's cultural heartland in the Red River Valley was part of the Chinese state from uh, 111 BCE to 939 CE. So there's always, kept, there's not always, but for a long period of time, there's been a Chinese influence in that southern region. A real effort to culturally assimilate the elite. Uh, China really was trying to take control of this area, uh, but rebellions will never, uh, will always be um, started among some of the peasants, even sometimes among your military leaders. And so China struggled to control this area. Uh, Vietnamese rulers adopted the Chinese approach to government, so the examination system helped undermine established uh, aristocrats. 
and the elite remain deeply committed to the Chinese culture. Uh, so that will be one aspect that is a little bit different than Korea. Uh, here's your um, Champa Kingdom that you're going to have in the south. And so the northern part of Vietnam is going to have more influence on uh, or be more in influenced by China, that Red River Valley area. All right. Much of the uh, distinctive Vietnamese culture remained in place. Um, language, cockfighting, um, betel nuts, uh, greater roles for women. Uh, that was going to be one of the main uh, sticklers that you're going to see that Vietnam will just not give up the rights of their women. Uh, kept nature goddesses and female Buddha in popular belief. Uh, developed a variation of Chinese writing, so they kind of had their own um, script that they're going to have. And so uh, Vietnam will still be distinctive in their own manners, uh, while obviously taking some from China. All right, now let's go ahead and look at Japan here. Japan was never invaded or conquered by China, not even when the Mongols controlled them later down the road. Uh, so borrowing of Chinese culture was voluntary. That's a major difference where China tried to impose their will upon Korea and Vietnam, uh, whether successful or just um, through little things of acceptance by these areas. China, Japan was always at least able to uh, say what they wanted and what they did not. A main period of cultural borrowing was in the 7th to 9th centuries when uh, first unified Japanese state began to emerge. And so we're going to see the creation of the Japanese bureaucratic state modeled on China began with Shotoku uh, Tashi in 572 to 622. A large-scale missions to China uh, to learn, so they're going to send a lot of their elites and their educated to China to learn about their bureaucracy and how things work. Uh, you'll have a 17-article constitution that will be developed based off of a lot of the aspects. You're going to have two capitals, and there's going to be some feuds between these and also some Buddhist problems that's going to cause them to move, uh, but their court lives are extravagant. Uh, you're going to have uh, Nara and then Heian, and they were both fought, both founded on the model of the Chinese capital, Chang'an, so that is a similarity between them and Korea. All right, and here is uh, the map that you're going to have of uh, Japan, and we'll learn more about the cities of Kyoto and Kamakura later down the road. All right, and here's uh, a map of your uh, spread of Buddhism uh, that is eventually going to make it over to Japan, which is going to have an impact on the Japanese society. All right, elements of Chinese culture took root in Japan. Several schools of Chinese Buddhism are going to emerge. Art, architecture, education, medicine, religious views, uh, Chinese writing, system, which eventually Japan will um, defer a little bit, uh, but eventually have their own. Uh, Japanese borrowings were selective, as I just mentioned earlier, being voluntary. Uh, Japan never created an effective centralized and bureaucratic state, though. They are going to struggle because there are what essentially are these uh, 300 daimo, which were these local authorities of the bushi, which uh, were your military leaders and then uh, developed their own military focus, which were the samurai. And so those were the ones who carried things out. So it was kind of, this would be their feudal time period, which the samurai is a great comparison to the um, medieval knights that are going to exist. All right, uh, religious distinctiveness. Buddha never uh, replaced the native belief system which will be Shintoism, and this has to do with the way of the uh, kami, which were your sacred spirits. And so they did have a spiritual aspect that uh, will not get replaced, but Buddhism will gain some popularity uh, until there uh, is some struggles, and Buddhism is wanting to, you have some monks who are a little bit overzealous and want to take control. A uh, distinctive literary and artistic culture will emerge, a unique writing system mixed with Chinese characters with phonetic symbols, are going to emerge. They start to differ a little bit than the Chinese way. Early development of the uh, tanka, which is a highly uh, stylized poetry that will exist. Uh, literature and the arts were something that were highlighted in all these satellite areas because of the uh, height that it's going to receive under China, especially the Southern Song. Highly refined um, aesthetic court culture, uh, especially in the hand court culture where um, you're going to have um, 
an interaction of how people interact with each other, um, kind of like a, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, not proper, but um, oh, what's the thing where you learn how to dance, how you learn how to eat? Um, I even took this class. Uh, anyway, I'll remember probably after I'm done giving this lecture and recording it. Uh, but anyway, they, there's a sense of properness of how things operate uh, in this uh, life of luxury that they're going to have as well. Uh, you'll see uh, concubines in this area of their court life. And so um, it's a, a very uh, liberal arts way of life. Uh, elite women escaped most of the Confucian oppression, so you won't have to deal with that like you did in China. And then your spillovers, China's impact on Eurasia. Many of China's technological innovations spread beyond its borders. Uh, salt production uh, was through solar evaporation. Uh, you're going to have uh, paper making, which is going to spread. If you went back and looked at that map again, it's going to show you a lot of these things. Uh, Gunpowder, uh, which is going to spread. And, of course, obviously, it eventually will reach Europe where they're going to refine it and make it a little bit more different. Uh, Chinese textile with your um, metallurgy, your naval technologies are going to emerge during this time with the magnetic compass. You'll also have uh, your larger ships at this time period. Uh, Chinese prosperity is going to stimulate commercial life all over uh, Eurasia. Uh, on the receiving end, China is an economic beneficiary. Uh, China learned cotton and sugar cultivation, uh, which was a process from India. China was transformed around 1,000 by the introduction of new rice strains from Vietnam, which I had mentioned earlier. And technological creativity uh, was suppressed by cross-cultural contacts. Uh, a growing participation in the ocean trade as well. Um, foreign merchant settlements in the southern Chinese ports by the Tang era. So they are going to uh, be selective in some of the ports that they will open up for trade. Uh, sometimes it brought some violence and uh, obviously sometimes China would close its ports, but uh, there were a few ports that they were going to let open and have international trade. Transformation of the southern China uh, to production for export instead of substance will be something that was pretty large during the um, uh, Song Dynasty. Uh, China and Buddhism. Buddhism was India's most important gift to China. Now, remember, Hinduism was the most popular in India, but as something that China is going to accept from somewhere else, it would be Buddhism. China's only large-scale cultural borrowing until Marxism in the 20th century when we get into what happens with Confuci um, communism. Uh, China was the base for Buddhism and the spread to Korea and Japan, which is important because they'll be influenced by that. Um, and But there will be some differences of how this ends up working. Buddhism is going to enter China via the Silk Roads, and obviously some of the missionaries that were sent out, um, and also those that followed merchants in your sea routes. Had little appeal at first, because again, it was a foreign idea. And then Indian culture was too different from the um, Chinese, and so that was going to be another reason why it wasn't appealing. Uh, again, here's your spread of Buddhism. We saw this map earlier. All right, Buddhism took root 300 to 800 CE. Uh, the collapse of the Han Dynasty will obviously uh, cause some chaos and some acceptance of Buddhism. And, of course, Buddhism is going to change as well. Monasteries provided increasing array of social services, and Buddhists appear to have access to magical powers, which was appealing to the Chinese, something spiritual that was different than your secular way of life under Confucianism. Uh, serious effort to present Buddha's, uh, Buddhism in a form acceptable to the Chinese, and that's where you get your Mahayana uh, form of Buddhist that became very popular. All right, the Sui and early Tang dynasties gave support to Buddhism. The Sui Emperor Wen Di had uh, monasteries built as a base of Chinese five sacred mountains. Monasteries became very wealthy uh, because of the amount of land that they have, which eventually when there is a Buddhist backlash, it'll be taking a lot of their land. Uh, Buddhism was never independent from the state authorities. Uh, losing state support, the crisis of Chinese Buddhism, which I was just mentioning. Uh, the growth of Chinese Buddhism provoked resistance and criticism, especially among the Confucian uh, elites because of their monasteries. They also didn't like the idea of the celibacy and withdrawing from society. And, of course, it was foreign. And so there's going to be laws that are going to be restrictive to Buddhism. Um, your new um, xenophobia perhaps started with a um, 
with uh, Lushan Rebellion, which was led by a foreign general. Chinese state began direct action against the foreign religions in 841 to 845, and 260,000 monks and nuns were forced to return to secular life. Uh, thousands of monasteries, temples, and shrines were confiscated or destroyed. Buddhists forbidden to use precious metals or gems for their images uh, because of the wealth and the state wanting that back. Buddhism did not vanish from China. It remained an important element of popular religion, especially among the lower classes. All right, and here we're going to wrap it up. So empires in East Asia, if you want to pause, look at their comparisons here. This is a pretty good chart for you. Uh, as well as the inventions under the Tang and Song China, uh, their descriptions, their impact. That's important. Just don't read what it is. Look at the impact as well because that's uh, important and can help you with evidence and analysis. And that concludes it for us.